For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what the Apostle Paul has just said in the passage before where we're at today, in Romans chapter 10. We kind of stopped in the middle of Paul's thought, basically. He sort of rounds out one of his thoughts, but then he starts asking questions in the middle part of Romans chapter 10. We're going to be looking at verses 14 through 21 today, and I read that last part so that we understand the context of why the Apostle Paul would then start asking these questions, rhetorical questions, basically. He's helping us see how someone will come to call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. And to summarize, or to make sure we're grasping what he's meaning by calling upon the name of the Lord, this is, this is not really that helpful to say, well, what he's saying is what we call today the sinner's prayer. You know, you repeat these words after someone else, and that is how you call upon the name of the Lord. Now, that's not really that helpful, but to call upon the name of Jesus is to basically give yourself to Jesus, to call upon His authority, to go to God on behalf of what Jesus has done for you. Someone's name has to do with their accomplishments, their successes. And to call upon the name of the Lord, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, is to basically appeal to God based on what Jesus has done for sinners. To say, my faith is in Jesus, and I make my appeal to God. I have access to God only through what Jesus Christ has done in the place of sinners. Namely, living without sin, as none of us have but doing so so that we who believe in Jesus, trust in Jesus, would be counted righteous, would be what theologians call Jesus' righteousness would be imputed, accredited, given to us so that it basically is deposited into our account. So that though we are unrighteous, we get to be counted righteous before God. That's what Jesus was doing in his perfectly sinless life. And at the end of that sinless, perfect, holy, obedient life, Jesus went to a cross to pay for the sins of everyone who will call upon his name. Everyone who will come to him. And three days later, rising from the dead, conquering sin and death, Jesus is truly our Savior. So calling upon the name of the Lord is hearing the gospel, understanding what Jesus has done for sinners, trusting in him and making, your, making an appeal to God that for Jesus' sake, accept me. It's not praying a prayer and asking Jesus into your heart, but it's banking everything on who Jesus is and what he's done. That's what the Apostle Paul has just said in this first half of Romans 10. If you were here last week, we, we looked at that in great detail. This great promise, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And I want to present to you in verses 14 through 21 that we see two big things and then at the end we'll see that Paul turns again to address the fact that Israel the Jews, by and large at this time, had rejected the gospel of Jesus. But the two main points that we see here in verses 14 and 15, we see that fulfilling the Great Commission, and I'll unpack what that means, fulfilling the Great Commission is a group effort. Fulfilling the Great Commission is a group effort. And secondly, we will see the Great Commission is a command of Jesus to herald, proclaim, profess. So those, those two main things that we're going to see. I think we'll see a lot of things here, but I want you to wrap your mind around those. If you learn something clear today about what God commands of us and what He's revealing to us 
in Romans 10, 14 through 21, I want you to see that fulfilling the Great Commission is a group effort, and the Great Commission is a command to herald, to speak. So start with me in verse 14. Fulfilling the Great Commission, it's a group effort. So if everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved. Everyone who comes to faith in Jesus. Now Paul's going to say, well, how does anyone come to faith in Jesus? The great commission of the Lord Jesus just before he ascended was go into all the nations making disciples and baptizing them into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, if you grew up in the Bible Belt like I did, you've heard those verses a lot. It's a command. Let me remind you, it's a command. It's a commission. It's not the great suggestion. He says, go. Go make disciples of all nations. So we go preaching the gospel, proclaiming the gospel to people. And everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And then we teach them to observe. We work together to obey, to observe everything that Jesus has commanded us. But in these verses, we see that fulfilling that great commission, it takes all of us. It takes the whole body of Christ. Look at verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How is someone going to make an appeal to God, basically trust Jesus and have their standing before God, be what Jesus has done for them if they don't believe in Jesus? How will they call upon the name of the Lord to save them if they don't believe in Jesus? Well, you see, he just moves logically through this. And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? How are they going to believe unless someone says it? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. That last little sentence there, you may notice, is in quotations in your Bible. It's because he's quoting the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, verse 7. But he's drawing all this out and helping us understand, and maybe some of you go, well, duh, of course those things have to happen. But what Paul is doing for us here is laying out and making sure we understand the process by which someone comes to faith in Jesus, and that it takes every one of these steps if someone is going to be saved. Now, God can do whatever he wants. Please do not hear me saying that God is limited to doing things a certain way. He can do whatever He wants, and we can't say a thing about it. But the ordinary way, the way that He has revealed to us that He saves people in real time, people hear the gospel and come to be saved, is that they are first sent. If you work backwards through this passage, they are sent. They're commissioned. What are they commissioned to do? They're commissioned to preach to proclaim, to herald, to profess. Well, what are they preaching? Well, they're preaching about Jesus so that the people who hear them preaching will hear and understand about the Lord Jesus. And then in hearing, they will believe in Jesus. And by believing, they will call upon the name of Jesus and be saved. They will entrust themselves to Jesus. But do you see that moving all through here, this is not something that's just done in isolation. If you work backwards and you want to go like the first link in the chain for people coming to faith in Jesus is that they are sent. Work backwards with me through this so we can start from the going out until people finally hear, believe on Jesus, call upon the name of the Lord and are saved or reconciled to God. First of all, they are sent. Now, this word sent is, in the Greek, it's apostello, which is where we get our word apostle. Paul is an apostle. Apostle, that word literally means a sent one. 
But more specifically, biblically speaking, an apostle is one who was sent by the Lord Jesus himself, visibly seeing the resurrected Jesus and then being audibly commissioned by Jesus. Apostles are sent with the authority of Jesus even. So we see the apostles are the foundation of the church. The foundation. They laid the foundation of the gospel message in the early church. And then at the end of the first century, they died. And there were no more apostles. These are sent ones, commissioned ones, by the Lord Jesus. And that is, in one sense, what the Apostle Paul probably has in mind when he talks about being sent. He probably has in mind himself and the twelve apostles who were sent and commissioned by Jesus. They were sent by Jesus. But at the same time, I think Paul has in mind not just apostles, but he has in mind anyone who has been sent by Jesus on mission. He has in mind not just apostles that are all now dead, and we have their writings in the New Testament. He also has in mind those whom the Lord calls to be pastors and preachers and teachers. I think he has in mind ordinary Christians as well. And by ordinary, I don't mean that in a demeaning way, but I mean you don't hold any office in the local church. You're not a pastor or a teacher. You may not even lead a community group or teach a Bible study. But every Christian has been sent, has been commissioned by Jesus. Maybe not with the same authority that the Apostle Paul says. But if you remember in John chapter 17, the Lord Jesus is praying the night before his crucifixion. And he prays for all Christians. He even says at one point in his prayer, I'm not praying only for these that are right here. But I'm praying for those who will come to believe in me through these apostles telling them about me. And he says repeatedly through this prayer, Father, as you have sent me into the world, so I send them into the world. I'm sending them on mission. And we know that then following that, after his death and his resurrection, we get in the Great Commission the command, go and make disciples of all nations. So friends, to kind of boil this all down, if you have been saved by Jesus, you have been sent by Jesus. You have been commissioned by Jesus to proclaim the truth of the gospel and to help explain it and persuade people to understand the truth of the gospel, and then call for the verdict for them to trust in Jesus, believe in him, and call upon his name, and be saved. So in one sense, sent meaning apostles, but in another sense, sending meaning every Christian. Jesus' high priestly prayer teaches us that every Christian has been sent. It is our not only opportunity, but it is our duty to proclaim the excellencies of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. If you've been saved by Jesus, you have been sent by Jesus. And yet there's even another instance that we, we must think about this word sent. How are they going to preach unless they are sent? Well, apostles are sent. Every Christian is sent. And then we learn throughout the book of Acts that it is the job of local churches to send missionaries, to send church planters, whether it be locally or globally. We see this with the church at Antioch. They sent Paul and Barnabas to go into far regions of the known world to go and proclaim the gospel and to plant churches there. We see that Antioch, all these people are the sending church. They're the supporting church of the Apostle Paul. They lay their hands on Paul. Paul's an apostle. If anyone could say, I don't need a church to send me. I don't need a sending church to say, well, I was sent from the church at Antioch. This body of believers and the elders, they laid their hands on me. They commissioned me and Barnabas to go. If anyone could say that, I mean, it'd be Paul. 
that even Paul and Barnabas were sent and commissioned, and we get in that function of the Church of Antioch, we see a model and a pattern that has been followed by every faithful church since the establishment of the church. Local churches exist not to just be for themselves, but to send missionaries, to send church planters. So when we gather for worship every week, what we we should be doing in one sense is, is worshiping Jesus, but then your pastor should be equipping you so that then you are sent out into your life, and yet at the same time we should be sacrificing and giving and praying and working towards sending specific missionaries and church planters to not just go out into normal jobs like we do in our lives and evangelize people, but we should be working towards sending church planters and missionaries to go to people who do not yet know Jesus or to establish churches in towns or areas that do not know the gospel. Do you see how from this, if you start backwards and work your way, this is a group effort. If we are going to be senders as a church, that means if you're a sender, some people are staying so that other people can be sent. And they're sent to do what? Well, they're sent to preach. This is the word keruso, which really, it, it means more than what we probably think of in our day when we think of the word preach probably think of something that's only formal, like what I'm doing right now, what we would call a sermon. And that's true. This is preaching. But this word is originally basically borrowed from the government, the governmental language of this day, which it just means a herald, an announcer. Someone who was a herald who did Caruso is someone who would most often not do it in a formal sense in a building, around people like this, but would go into the city square and make announcements on behalf of the leaders in the city or on behalf of the emperor. A herald is someone who is essentially like a living uh, and alive newspaper, publishing, proclaiming, announcing something that is not their opinion. That's not what a herald or a preacher, to use our English word, does. Preachers, heralds, announcers, publishers, newspapers. The job of such is not to give opinions as much as it is to give facts about what has happened. And now I know in newspapers we even have opinion sections. But bear with me. The analogy isn't perfect. But the point of proclaiming this preaching that he's speaking of is not for someone to go and tell you advice or opinions. The purpose of preaching, of proclaiming, announcing, this word right here means telling the truth about something that has happened that you desperately need to know about. And friends, if you've been saved, you've been sent, and you've been sent to maybe not formally do it like I do week in and week out by preaching a sermon, but you have been sent to Caruso. Announce the good news of Jesus. There are some places that only you can go. There are some ears that only can hear you. There are some hands only you can hold. There are some some people that only you are going to have contact with. You may be the only person that has the deposit of the gospel in you that some people ever come into contact with. And if you don't speak, if you don't announce to them what Jesus has done, they will not be saved. Please notice what the Apostle Paul is doing in Romans 9 and Romans 10. If Romans 9 leads you to go, well, Wow, okay, God is sovereign in salvation. He's going to save his people, which is true. But that leads you to basically just say, I can chill out. You know, I don't have to worry about telling people the gospel. They'll hear it, or God will save them. If that's what Roman 9, 9 leads you to do, you have drastically misunderstood what the Apostle Paul says. 
as was pointed out to us at the first part of Romans 10. He says, my heart's desire, my prayer to God, is that my kinsmen, the Jews who have rejected Jesus, they would be saved. And then halfway through chapter 10, he makes sure that we understand how are people going to be saved unless we tell them. We must tell them. They must hear. How are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? This hearing is not, the word is not just meaning hearing like audible sounds. It has to do with far more than just, oh, they heard you talking, but they weren't really understanding or grasping it. The point is that this word that's translated hearing means someone hearing a body of truth and being able to comprehend what you are communicating to them. It's like in the judicial system when you have a hearing before a judge. What does that mean? You have a hearing where there's a jury. Does it mean it doesn't really matter if the judge really understands what's being said or the jury really understands what the defense or what the prosecutor has to say? Well, no, you go, no, 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 that's not what a hearing means. If you have a hearing, you want to make sure the judge and the jury are comprehending what is being said, not just merely hearing audible sounds. You want to make sure make your argument plain and clear so that you get a proper hearing. That's what this word means. How are they to believe in him in whom they've never heard? They don't understand the gospel. And so in our proclaiming the gospel, announcing the gospel, sharing the gospel to our family, our friends, our co-workers, our neighbors, or maybe going overseas, or maybe going to another city to plant a church. Whatever, it, whatever situation you may be in in doing that, the goal is not to just say, Jesus lived, died, and arose so that you can be righteous and forgiven and reconciled to God. Do it. And you go, I, I got it in their ear. That may be all it takes. But our job is to do the best we can to explain, to help people think through the truthfulness of Jesus, the trustworthiness of Jesus, that we all know we have sin and guilt. Everyone knows that. Everyone feels the weight in their own God-given conscience. We tell them the truth of the gospel, that one came who did succeed so that everyone who comes to him will be reconciled to God. And we try to help people understand what that means. All of this is a group effort. When it comes to fulfilling the Great Commission, friends, to make disciples of all nations, if we follow this link, they have to be sent. They're sent to proclaim. They're proclaiming so that people can hear and understand and in understanding, through the work of God the Holy Spirit, they would come to believe, trust in Jesus. They have to know who Jesus is and what he's done if they're going to come to believe in him. And not just some superficial idea about a Jesus that's not really the Jesus of the Bible. And in understanding who Jesus is and what he's done, then they, in faith, will call upon the name of the Lord and be saved, be justified through their faith in Jesus. It takes all of us. And when it comes to this Great Commission, if we're going to fulfill it, if you're going to be part of fulfilling it, you better be going or sending. Because if you're not a goer or a sender when it comes to fulfilling it worldwide, the only other option is you are disobedient to the Lord Jesus. There are goers, there are senders, and there are those who are disobedient to Jesus. When it comes to world missions, now in your own life, you only have two options. In your everyday life, I mean, at your job, in your home, you're either a goer or you're disobedient. Parents, how will your children come to believe in Jesus and be justified, counted righteous, if you don't tell them the gospel, 
and not just tell them words, but help them understand it? How will they call upon the name of the Lord if they don't believe? How will they believe if you don't help them hear? How will they hear if you don't tell them? You've been sent. How will the people in your job come to faith in Jesus if you don't tell them? How will your family? I know many of you have family who aren't believers. Don't use the sovereignty of God as revealed in Romans 9 as a crutch for your disobedience or cowardice when it comes to proclaiming the truth. How will they call on him and whom you don't tell them about? They must be told. They must hear. And the beautiful thing is at the end of verse 15 that he quotes Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Why are they beautiful feet? Because feet here has to do with you carrying the message to someone. How beautiful are the feet? How beautiful is it when someone takes the gospel message to someone else? You see the metaphorical language? And so, friends, I just ask you at the closing of this, when we see fulfilling the Great Commission is a group effort, we all do our part, both in our city, abroad, and we all do our part to sacrifice and give so that we can send other people. Are your feet beautiful? Are you standing still? Are you going? If you've been saved, you've been sent. Go and proclaim the good news of the gospel. And what is that good news real specifically? If you know the book of Isaiah at all, you probably know of chapters 52 and 53. Maybe one of the most famous Old, passages, Old Testament passages because it speaks of God sending His servant and this servant of the Lord shall act wisely. And yet, having acted wisely and never sinning, we read in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, and then at the end of chapter 53, we read that he will, though, see light and be satisfied. He will, my servant, the Lord says, he will make many to be accounted righteous because he bore their iniquities. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news, who preach the good news. And friends, the good news that we preach is of God's servant, the Lord Jesus, who came and acted perfectly, who acted wisely, and yet, according to the divine plan of God, and willingly did the Lord Jesus do this, he was crushed. We take a message to the world, not of what must be done, but what has been done in Jesus. Right after this, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news, who preach the good news, we get the good news is that the Lord Jesus was willingly crushed for rebels like us. He bore our iniquities, and he will save everyone who comes to him through faith. The only way your feet are going to be beautiful and you're going to be committed to taking the good news is that if you, if you constantly remember how much you need the good news, and secondly, how the good news is not based on how good you can tell it or how good you can do. It's based on trying to lay plain and help people understand that Jesus stood in my place. He stood in your place. As the old song says, in my place condemned he stood. He sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a Savior. That's the good news of the gospel. We take a message of the finished work. And it's a group effort to take that to our friends, our family, and to the world. We really need what some call the greatest generation. The generation that we're young adults, especially during World War II, we need 
some of that lifeblood that was flowing in them and how they acted during World War II. We need to look at that example and sort of try to import that into our spiritual life as we follow Jesus when it comes to fulfilling the Great Commission. People were sacrificing everything they could in order to support the war effort because they knew this is death coming for us. We have a real enemy. And this is just physically speaking. This is just right here and now in our world. They would pause high school basketball games to find a hairpin because they were trying to be so particular and not wasting money so that they could put all the money they could towards the war effort. Where are the people like that? They were penny pinchers beyond a shadow of a doubt. They sold and bought war bonds. They did everything they could to send every dime they could to the war effort. And so look at their example and say, if they did that to defeat the Nazis, to go and try to accomplish something, why can we not do things like that in order to send more money to the mission field, more money towards planting churches, and why can we not do everything we can to get the gospel into people's ears? There are countless stories about boys, boys who are not even 18 yet, who forged papers, lied about their ages because they so desperately wanted to go and fight and defend their country. Now we have 30-year-old boys they don't care about Jesus that much. They pay him lip service. They haven't even considered going to the mission field. Parents, don't raise your children to be children forever. Raise them to be adults. Raise them to be adults quickly. Raise them to see that giving their lives on the mission field for the name of Jesus is worth it. Show them real heroes. Show them that it is a group effort for us to get the gospel out. How are they going to call on him unless we're sending, preaching, they're hearing, and they believe? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And secondly, and quickly, in verses 16 and 17, we've already seen this pretty clear, but Paul makes sure and emphasizes that the Great Commission is a command to proclaim, to herald, to speak. So when you hear someone say something like, preach the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words, at least in your mind, make this sound. <laughs> Don't do it to someone. That's probably not helpful. Preach the gospel at all times means you must be speaking. It is a message about what has happened. It's not something that people just see your loving acts and say, Jesus Christ must have died on the cross to forgive my sins. I need to trust him. It's not how God operates. It is a message we must herald. And he says in verse 16, look at it. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. Not everyone has obeyed the gospel. And he has Israel specifically in mind here. They have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? Again, that's from Isaiah chapter 53, right in the middle of that suffering servant, Jesus dying on the cross, prophesied 700 years before he came, right in the middle of that, Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what they have heard from us? He says they've not all obeyed the gospel. And then in verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Verse 16, Paul is being ironic a little bit, I think. Because if you remember, what, he, what he's been laying out in the book of Romans is that the Jews at this time, by and large, rejected the message of the gospel, which says, we are counted righteous through faith in Jesus, not through our obedience and our achievements in obeying the law of God. That's the law of that leads to righteousness, he says, that's not going to happen. He says, you will be justified 
with the righteousness of God, God will give you His righteousness through faith in Jesus. So what's ironic in verse 16 when he says, they have not all obeyed the gospel. That's, that's another way to say, it. they have not all heard the message and from hearing it, obeyed God's summons to trust in Jesus. They've not all had faith in Jesus. That's what it means to obey the gospel. But he uses that word, I think, to help his Jewish readers and help us understand that the Jews at this time who were rejecting the gospel and they were trying to obey God's law in order to establish their righteousness, in fact, by rejecting the gospel and trying to obey to be righteous, they were disobeying God because they were not obeying the gospel. The point, friends, for us, or the application for us, is that we must remember we cannot obey ourselves into a right standing with God. First of all, because there's no way you can do it. Second of all, it's because God has chosen to not accept the currency of your good works. And that's good for you and me, because the currency that you could accumulate through your good works would be nothing but a pile of dung. God accepts the righteousness of Jesus and he gives it to us through faith so that we wear his righteousness like a robe. So I ask you in passing as we come to that verse, do you obey the gospel? Do you personally believe in trust in Jesus? Have you appealed to God to accept you for Jesus' sake? Do you obey God's summons to say, you can't do it, you haven't done it, but I have. Come and rest in me. Come and trust in me. Come and follow me. Though your sins be like scarlet, I will make you white as snow. Do you obey the gospel? If not, if your trust is not in Jesus, but you're still clinging to something in yourself or something outside of yourself other than Jesus, you are disobeying God. No matter how hard you're trying to obey His laws and rules, if you don't obey the gospel by having simple faith in the living Christ, you disobey God. This is counterintuitive. Basically, everything else in our world works by you achieving and then you getting. But you could never achieve a right standing with God. So Jesus did it for us. But then in verse 17, he makes sure that we understand if people are going to come to faith in Jesus, they have to hear. So faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. They have to hear about Jesus. You have to hear about Jesus. You want your faith to be strengthened? Read as much as you can. Pray as much as you can. Gather for worship and sit under the preaching and teaching of the Word of God as much as you possibly can. Faith comes through hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. And the Word of Christ, the Word about Christ, the Gospel message is revealed in the Bible. Go to the Word. That's how faith comes. You want your friends to come to faith? Proclaim. Talk. Announce to them the good news of what Jesus has done. And as we do that, Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, speaks through their ears and gets into the heart. And gives them faith. That's how God operates. The Great Commission is not a command to simply do good works and then people will just figure it out on their own. We must speak. As some encouragement, I feel that many of us can hear that and go, I have my marching orders. I'm supposed to speak about Jesus. And I'm not very good at speaking. I'm not very good at... I just feel like I can't make a clear thought sometimes. I'm just going to confuse people. Friends, it's not your ability... The success of evangelism or God saving people is not in your ability to communicate so eloquently 
that someone will go, oh my gosh, I get it. You said that so beautifully. That's not how God works. Hey, we want to try to do the best we can. But let me give you some encouragement. In the mid, or in the early 1800s, there was a young boy who was not a Christian, and he was desiring to know the gospel message. And so one Sunday morning, he was trying to go to the normal church he went to, and there was a great snowstorm. And so he had to stop off in this little, what in this day was called a primitive Methodist church. He walks in, and he sits at the back under the gallery, and he starts listening to the man who gets up there to preach. And apparently the normal preaching pastor wasn't able to get to the church building that day because of the snowstorm. So one of the deacons or one of the lay elders was there, and they had the text of Scripture, and it was from the book of Isaiah, and the guy who's not a preacher gets up there, and this boy recounts later that he he was actually not very good at all. It's like all he had was this verse that said, Look unto me, all the ends of the earth, and be saved. He said, so this man basically took every word and said, Well, the text says, Look unto me. And so we are to look now unto Christ. You don't have to be educated to look. You don't have to know much to look. You don't have to be a good person to look. All you need is to look unto Christ. And he says, look unto Christ all of you. And this guy is just like saying the same thing over and over. And towards the end of this little, what was apparently a pretty much struggling sermon, he looks back and sees this boy and says, young man, I see that you are quite miserable. And you will be miserable for eternity unless you obey my text. And this boy, at that time, who, who had been trying to understand how to be saved through this man who he never even learned his name, he heard the message of the gospel that Jesus is enough. Look to him. Trust in him. And you will be saved. And God saved him. His eyes were opened. He said, it's, it's like heaven opened up and I understood. It was looking to and trusting the Lord Jesus. This man was the most influential preacher in the 1800s, and his name was Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He was converted under someone that we don't even know his name, who was probably one of the worst preachers you could imagine. But all he did was say, this is what God says. Jesus is enough. Look to Jesus, and you will be saved. Are you willing to do that? God can draw straight lines with crooked sticks like you and me. Tell people about Jesus. Call them to come to faith in Him. Lastly, Paul turns to readdressing the fact that Israel, the Jews at this time, are rejecting the message of the gospel. He's just said, well, people need to hear. And then in verse 18, look with me as we finish out this passage. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have. For their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. What Paul's saying in quoting Psalm 19.4, he's saying that to the Jewish people at this time, the gospel message has come to him. They have heard. They've heard it. It's not that there is a, a missing link in the chain as far as sending, preaching, hearing. Paul spent his days when he went to evangelize all throughout the known world at this time, not only preaching, but it says that he was persuading with them. He was reasoning with them. And he always went to the Jewish synagogues first. He went to the Jews. They have heard. He quotes this psalm as a way of saying, this has been fulfilled in this first century. They have heard the message. Their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. And then he quotes another passage. But I ask, did Israel not understand? From Mos First, Moses says in Deuteronomy 32, 21, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Now, we have to keep reading and understand, in order to understand what he's getting at. Like That doesn't seem like an answer to the understood. But all three of these next verses go together. 
In verse 20, he says, Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, in Isaiah 65, 1, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. He's talking about in those passages that with the Jews rejecting the gospel at this time because they wanted to obey themselves into a right relationship with God, God has set them aside and He is saving non-Jews, Gentiles. Paul's helping us see why at this time in the first century Gentiles like you and me were running into the kingdom, were embracing Jesus, were trusting Jesus. And Paul is pointing out that because the Jews at this time would not submit to the righteousness of God through faith, God was saving Gentiles instead and making them jealous through saving these people. Even those who did not seek Him. I've shown myself to those who do not ask for me. And then in verse 21, but of Israel. This is the explanation for why he's saving Gentiles. But of Israel, he says, all day long I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. This is what broke Paul's heart. This is why he said, I wish that I could be accursed. If my kinsmen, my Jewish brothers and sisters could be saved. And in the ending of this passage, friends, you must be reminded and you must be challenged. So must I. God is holding his hands out to you. Do not use the sovereignty of God and salvation as a crutch for your disobeying the gospel. You are responsible to come to Jesus, to embrace the good news, to receive Him through faith. He says all day long, I'm holding out my hands, saying, come, come to me. All who call upon me will be saved. So children, come to Jesus. The Lord is saying, come, come now. Trust in me. Trust in my cross. Adults, the Lord is holding out his hands to you. Don't be a disobedient and contrary people. Don't be thrust aside because you refuse to obey the gospel. Obey the gospel. And trust yourself to Jesus. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Don't let it be true of you what was true of these Jews in the first century. That hearts would break because you want to be disobedient and contrary to the way God saves people. You cannot be good enough. And the good news is that you don't have to be. Come to Him. Embrace Him. And all who come to Jesus will not be put to shame. He's the suffering servant. He suffered for us. We entrust ourselves to Him. Pray with me. Father God, <clears throat> apply to our hearts what we have seen in Your Word today. Give us courage and strength and boldness to go together as a group effort and make disciples of all nations. Help us to pinch pennies. Help us to wear out before we rust out. Help us to give everything we can to obeying you. Help us to be obedient to you and be concerned with our obedience to you more than what men think about us. We ask you to give us supernatural strength to keep going and keep pouring ourselves out so that your great commission may be fulfilled. Help our feet to be beautiful as we take the good news of the gospel to the world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.